Mm. Krishna's answer is quite elaborate. And it, it is almost like a war action plan that Krishna gives. This is, it's a sobering section, but it's also a very empowering, illuminating and empowering section. Let's look at it. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Kamesha Prodesha Rajoguna Samudbhavaha Mahashano Mahapapma Vidhyena Mihavairinam So let's look at what Krishna is saying here. The first thing he says is, it is Kama, the Sanskrit word Kama. Hmm. Now, a common translation of Kama is lust. And lust is generally translated as sexual desire. But lust, or generally when we use the word Kama, it can refer to any overpowering desire. Hmm. So, Somebody can have lust for power, as they say. Mm. So, while the sexual dimension is there, in this section, if you see, Krishna does not focus too much on the sexual dimension alone. What he talks about, the broad principles, can apply to any overpowering desire that eventually becomes self-destructive. So, he says that it is karma. Now, when um, we can have, we all have many strong desires. Sometimes they can be very strong as if they seem overpowering. So, somebody sees, okay, I see some food, I want to eat that food. Now, that desire, may, even may it's overpowering, it may not be destructive. Okay, I want to eat a particular kind of food. That does not necessarily mean that I'm going to eat that food so much that I'm going to get uh, get a stomach upset or I'm going to eat so much dessert that I'm going to get immediately a diabetic attack or something like that. But he's saying something more, that this, this particular desire, Kamesha, Krodesha. So every desire generally needs to have boundaries. So, okay, I want to eat good food, but in moderation, a reasonable quantity. I want to buy new stuff, okay, but moderation. But when the desire becomes so strong, so powerful, that all that is there is afterwards rage against boundaries. So that's a karma and krodha. That rage is krodha. So now, uh, why? Why can I not have more? Like children sometimes throw a tantrum. Child, mother says, okay, you can take one cookie. Why only one? I want a dozen cookies. So, now when a child throws a, throws a tantrum, it's understandable. Child is not intelligent enough. But when adults throw tantrums, they don't just throw tantrums. They can actually act in destructive ways. So then that the power of desire leads to rage. And when after the rage against boundaries, then there is the violation, the rejection of boundaries. And that is when things become really destructive. So, at one level, even if you think specifically about sexual desire also, it is, it is a, our sexuality is a part of our humanity. It is a part of our embodied condition. Now, there, have, there are, across history and geography, across, that means throughout uh, culture, across, throughout time and throughout various cultures, there have always been some boundaries. Even if you consider today's culture to be very liberal, still there is the boundary of consent. So there are always boundaries to sexuality. But when one rejects those boundaries, then the result, what happens is, Krishna says over here, it becomes two things. Devouring and sinful. Mahashano Mahapapma. Greatly devouring and greatly sinful. 
Now, the word sin is not particularly popular or cool in today's world. People say, oh, they say no, don't use the word sin. There's one postmodern author says, it is sinful to use the word sinful. But the point is that there is an understanding that there are certain things which are harmful. So it's ironic that while in the religious sense, people say don't use the word sinful. But on popular groups, a popular book on English grammar is called the, the sins of punctuation. That means how you should not punctuate. So sinful means basically wrong. There, it could be wrong because it's harmful in whatever ways. Oh. So the point is that we all have a tendency to indulge. But the tendency to indulge, when it goes beyond boundaries, then it can be highly destructive. So we could say sinful is more in a moral sense, where a person may do terrible things. But now devouring can also be in a practical sense. Say, for example, somebody becomes an alcoholic and he just can't resist alcoholism. Then that alcoholism, for example, how can it be all devour, greatly devouring? Our Prabhupada's translators are all devouring. You know, it can devour their income. Mm, it can devour their dignity. Alcoholic doesn't behave in the most uh, respectful or respectable of ways. You know, it can even destroy their livelihood. If they can't keep a job because they're so drunk, it can destroy their relationships. Then when they're drunk too much, they are so, they can even, it can destroy their humanity. Somebody who is drunk and desperate for drinking, they may just rob from others, they may hurt others. It can destroy everything. Of course, it will destroy their spirituality. That's one of the first casualties of any unwarranted intelligence, unwarranted indulgence, or not unwarranted, so which is unbounded indulgence. So the point is, it's all devouring. It's highly devouring. And therefore, Krishna says, this is the Ihavairinam. It's an enemy in this world. Now, there are impressions inside us. And <clears throat> those impressions prompt us towards certain actions. So, for example, we have eaten some delicious food in the past. And that memory is there inside us. And then, whenever we come to know oh, that food is available here, we want to eat it. So, in, Krishna will talk about this more, about the mechanism by which lust becomes all-devouring, karma becomes destructive. But, so if we consider the in, inner impressions, let's put it this way, the inner impressions, we have certain Im impressions of pleasure. And we also have some impressions of trouble. Trouble in the sense that, oh, suppose somebody is an alcoholic. The last time I drank so much, I had a terrible hangover. So if they remember the hangover, mm -hmm. then they have, they will stay within boundaries. Uh, but if they remember the, just the high and they forget the hangover, then they will think, okay, let's, let's drink again. Who cares? Uh, it won't happen to me. But the idea is at a basic level, we are all pleasure seeking. And because we are pleasure seekers, so wherever we believe pleasure is available, we just feel, we believe it's our right to be happy. And it's true, we all have a right to be happy. But at the same time, this right needs to be directed to the right way to be happy. And that is what spiritual wisdom takes like the Bhagavad Gita tells us. However, what happens is our impressions which are there within us, they often prompt us towards uh, indulgences 
which are often the indulgences themselves are unhealthy and our indulgence in them is also disproportionate so either of these because we feel that we want pleasure we have a right to pleasure and then he says okay no don't enjoy so much over here why should i not enjoy so much but there is a better a, a higher a richer a more healthier way to find find happiness but our impressions they they push us towards uh, uh, unhealthy ways because those impressions are already there within us and they are also triggered by the world outside krishna uses the word rajoguna samudbhavaha rajogun is the mode of passion what that means is that mm, if our environment if our it's filled with passion the situations we are in or even the dispositions we have cultivated then it's like we are putting ourselves in a inflammable situation we are our inflammable and then just we need one spark actually we don't need the spark but it it just needs one spark to light a huge fire so if our outer world outer situation is inflammable our inner situation is inflammable so what do you talk about the god shape the hole in the heart is if we are already feeling bored or frustrated or down and then some enjoyment comes up i just wanted it i wanted it i wanted more and more and more so if that in the environment if the outer environment is inflammable that means outside say everybody is feasting everybody is partying everybody is drinking we everybody is engaged in sexual revelry and then when we find ourselves in that environment or we put ourselves in that environment then the the fire this that just small spark can blaze into a huge fire so that's how this verse is talking about this this enemy as as desire without boundaries kamesha krodesha or desire that rages against boundaries craving that push not doesn't push against that just forces itself over boundaries you know you can consider the boundaries they are protective but they can seem restrictive so now krishna will talk about this in future verses about how our our knowledge acquiring apparatus gets sabotaged and that's when what is meant for our protection seems to be like a restriction or even it can seem like a deprivation why can't i have this who are you to stop me from having it later krishna will talk about how uh, this uh, the role of our intelligence is extremely important in combating or in at least curbing the such unbounded desire biology will lead to certain desires we can say it's fair enough so we have the desire to eat we may have the desire to mate but if you see biology also gives us boundaries you know we have we have finite capacity in our belly to eat we all have finite capacity for sexual indulgence but when say somebody becomes morbidly obese then what is happening is that you could say the psychology is actually overpowering the biology the body may say yeah enough the belly may start belching or the belly may start swelling and then the person says no oh, i want i want more the mind says more and more and more so it's almost as if this desire becomes uh becomes so much that it you can say it's physical desire but it's physical desire that goes against our physical well being also 
So, so boundaries are there, provided by the body. The bo body body creates desires, you could say, but the body also provides boundaries to those desires. But so this is where physical physical pleasure. That's what we are seeking, but that physical pleasure becomes even physically destructive. Say, for example, you can talk about food. Food is a physical pleasure in the sense that we eat it with our body. But then it can lead to so a host of health issues if a person is not careful. Similarly, sex is a physical pleasure, but there are so many sexually transmitted diseases that can come up. So the biology itself provides the natural boundaries, but the craving breaks down when you're talking about boundaries, the boundaries that craving tries to break down, that we rage against. The boundaries could be simply biological or physical. The boundaries could be cultural. The boundaries could be legal. The boundaries could be financial. The <clears throat> That means biological, I already explained, cultural boundaries could be that. You know, this is not the way uh, people, this is not the way we function in our society. But who cares? Legal boundaries. You know, oh, you'll be punished by the law. I'm clever enough to get out of it. Financial. You know, I just don't have money to enjoy. Okay, then I'll steal or rob. So we all, society gives us, I mean, various, our existential situation gives us various boundaries. But the desire rages against boundaries. Specifically, it's an out of control craving within the mind. So now Krishna is saying very significant over here, Iha Vairinam is enemy Iha in this world. So now this link between enemy in this world, or it can be translated as enemy of this world. So it's an enemy in this world means we are in a perpetual state of warfare. That there is, there is, if we knew that say somebody was out to destroy us, you know, if say we came to know that some some enemy, somebody has put some money and hired a mercenary and they are out, out to kill us, they're waiting for an opportunity. And we would have to be alert constantly. So this is so we are in a state of perpetual warfare. That is just a state. There are there are cravings that are out to destroy us. So that could be per enemy in this world. It's there for us. And it's significant that Krishna is speaking this on a battlefield to Arjuna. And Krishna is saying, This is your enemy. That is calm. Now he is on the other side in the army. There are big, big warriors. And yet. Krishna is not pointing to any of those enemies. Krishna is saying, this is the enemy. So what he's emphasizing, the inner war is actually the bigger war. Now, some of us may be in situations where we may sometimes have to fight a physical war also. But most of us, especially we live in a reasonably well-managed society, then we, we don't really have to get into physical fights or physical wars. But the inner war is something which is a bigger war it's an inescapable war. Bigger in the sense that everybody has to fight it. The exact boundaries within which people have to fight it may vary. So an alcoholic may have no compunctions about no moral or ethical compunctions about drinking. So, but they may have financial limitations. They have to fight against those. Everybody has to fight. And now, if you take the word enemy of this world, that means it is universal enemy. It's such uncontrolled craving can take the whole world down, not just the individual down, but mm, it can be universally deadly. One individual with such craving, more and more individuals with such craving, the individual can be destroyed and even the world can be destroyed by that. So, which is a very sobering verse overall, which points out the danger of such self-destructive desire. 
I'll summarize what we discussed today. The first point was based on 336 that there is the um, self-destructive force within us, self-destructive force which makes us act as if unwillingly, even when we are unwilling, we feel as if we are forced. So what is that? That's the question by Arjuna. And then Krishna's answer is in 337. So we discuss many points within that. It is desire that rages against boundaries. That is what is the enemy. And Krishna gives multiple features of particular characteristics of this. He says that you know, this, all the remaining points are about 337 itself. But he says that such a desire that rages against boundaries that it becomes, if we put ourselves in an inflammable situation or disposition, condition or disposition, that's like Rajoguna, then, then we are even more vulnerable. And when it takes charge, it can be greatly devouring, it can devour our dignity, our humanity, our financial stability, and it can be greatly sinful. So both from a, from an ethical and a practical, social, per, practical perspective, it can be extremely dangerous. And Krishna says lastly that this is, so it's, it's, it's one level we discuss this point about how this is a, mm, this is our longing for pleasure, which is, which is right for us. It, it, it goes misdirected. Misdirected means two things. It goes in unhealthy directions or it goes towards to disproportionate degrees. And we, if th this is the enemy, we all have an enemy. It can be of this world or in this world, both ways. That means this. we are all in a state of perpetual warfare. And even on the battlefield, Krishna is telling Arjuna that this inner war is actually the bigger war that he needs to be ready to fight and that we all need to be ready to fight. Thank you.